Our next um, panelist is Jamila Rakib, and she is executive director at the Albert Einstein Institution, a nonprofit organization focused on the study and the use of strategic nonviolent action in conflicts throughout the world. Um, Thanks very much, uh, Melissa, and thanks for those fascinating <laughs> remarks, guys. Um, I'm really honored to be here today. This is a really historic event, and so thank you for the invitation uh, to participate. I hope my comments today are, are helpful. Um, I'd like to ask you all to think about the most serious political challenges of our time and our responses to them uh, in a different way. And in doing that, perhaps we can see a solution that can be very important for the future of our world. Um, dictatorships, oppression, invasions, occupations, injustices of all kinds. These problems exist, and at times when we watch the news or read it online or in newspapers, um, they could seem overwhelming. Around the world, many people that are experiencing injustice are asking a very daunting but important political question. That is, how can we become free? How can we drive out a foreign occupation, stop a foreign invasion, how can we oust our dictator and replace our oppressive system with one that is more free, more just, more representative, and allows for greater participation? Many well-meaning people think that if they simply denounce oppression long enough and protest it strong enough, the desired outcome will somehow materialize. There's a general helplessness when people feel like they can't make change. It's a condition that comes from a sense that you lack the, the tools to control your own life, let alone shape the societal, political, economic, international events that are taking place around you. The helplessness works in favor of dictators and of oppressive rulers. They'll try to make you think that they're stronger than they actually are. They'll try to make you think that power comes from a barrel of a gun, and since they have all the guns, resistance is futile. The problem for people facing oppression is twofold. How do you weaken an oppressive system? And how do you strengthen a population so that it's able to resist powerfully and effectively? Um, there's a quote by an Indian sociologist that really resonates with me, uh, and it's a real basis for the work that I do. The tyrant has the power to inflict only that which we lack the strength to resist. Nonviolent action is that powerful and effective means to conduct a struggle and to strengthen a population. It has a long history and it's freed millions of people living under tyranny all over the world. It's been used in various types of conflicts throughout human history to resist oppression, to undermine dictatorships, to oppose foreign invasion and occupation, to defend the rights of minorities, of women, of workers, and to expand freedoms of all kinds. For nearly 30 years, the Albert Einstein Institution, which has been led by our senior scholar, Jean Sharp, has been studying how nonviolent means of struggle actually operate. So what we do is we study the historical cases of the use of nonviolent means of action. So we've distilled from that information on how the technique operates, what makes it work, what are the factors that lead to failure, and how that information can be used by groups who are looking to explore these means for their struggles today. We've shared the results of this research through books, both printed and online, so that people who want to develop their own strategies can do so, and they can do that self-reliantly. Until I started working with Jean Sharp, I thought that violent means were the only way to solve serious political problems, including those that are experienced by Afghanistan, where I was born. Uh, that was because, like so many other people, I didn't know that there existed this powerful, pragmatic alternative to violence. And as I learned more about this unique approach, I began to recognize this technique as a powerful weapon system, as an alternative to both violence and also passivity. So how does it work? The basic idea is very simple. The technique is quite complex. But it's based on an analysis of where power comes from in a society. So all governments, whether democratic or even extreme dictatorships, rely on cooperation and obedience from people and institutions for their survival. When people choose to withdraw that cooperation and obedience, governments are left without any of the sources of power that are necessary for them to function. So basically, people refuse to do that which they're told to do and do that which is forbidden. And instead of using guns and bombs, people use social, economic, and political forms of non-cooperation. And ultimately, these weapons are more powerful than military ones. So the struggles in North Africa and in the Middle East have uh, brought a lot of new attention to this technique. 
Uh, but what you see on your television screens is only the tip of the iceberg. Street protests, demonstrations, parades, and vigils, they're very important uh, as symbolic methods to demonstrate that people are angry, demonstrate dissatisfaction. But the most powerful part of the struggle is what you don't see and what the news media can't often capture. Uh, these are the methods of non-cooperation and defiance. Uh, what you have to do is paralyze your opponent, be that a repressive government or economic system or a corporation. You'll notice I didn't mention anything about the need for participants in these struggles to be moral or good or any of those subjective and hard to define terms. Nonviolent action ultimately depends on people doing what people do best, which is be annoyingly stubborn when, when they make up their minds to do that. The events of this year, specifically the Tunisian revolutions, the ones in Egypt, and the ongoing struggles that are taking place in Syria and Bahrain and Yemen and elsewhere and in our streets as well, have brought about a new awareness. That awareness has had a massive impact on people's thinking. Uh, it'll make it very difficult for those whose rule depends on complacency and helplessness because people have seen what's possible. The power of ordinary people and the weakness of oppressive systems and of dictators has been dramatically displayed for all of us to see. And that alone has changed the world. But the awareness alone is not enough. In order to succeed, it helps to have a wise plan, or what we call a grand strategy. In order to have a wise plan, you need to study. It's crucial to understand how the technique operates so that this information can help guide you in the development of your own struggle. The lessons gained from our books, and I've, I have a few here today, uh, are potentially useful to groups facing very diverse conflicts on nearly every continent and perhaps even Antarctica. Uh, people think that the last thing they should do to prepare for change in their societies is to read a book, but actually that's the first thing you should do. In our experience, access to these writings can be critical. People risk their lives to translate them. People are serving jail sentences for carrying even a single copy of of this book written by Jean Sharp. These are all available to us, so I, I, I advise you to, to check them out. Um, the resources that are needed to make struggles more effective are now available to groups, much more so than in the past. Groups who are engaged in these struggles no longer need to reinvent the wheel. Freedom from tyranny ultimately depends on people's ability to liberate themselves. By the time we at the Albert Einstein Institution hear from people, something has changed in their minds. Because whatever it is that's brought them to our doors or caused them to write us an email or call us up has planted a seed in their mind. It's a seed of an awareness of a possibility. That possibility is that they can take action, that that action can be effective, and that that effectiveness can lead to a greater chances that they're going to be successful in bringing about the changes they want in their societies. The massive uprisings that have taken place this year in the world, uh, they were triggered and carried out by regular people, like, like you and I, uh, not by elite powers. Um, ultimately, it's up to us to free ourselves. And the good news is that with careful thinking, wise planning, and courageous action, doing that is within our grasp. Thank you. Thank you.